Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this uh, Mother's Day. Lord, we thank you for all the moms, Lord, and for their sacrifice uh, so that we as kids, Lord, can be encouraged and taken care of, Lord. And we Mm. pray now that as our Heavenly Father, you would encourage us, Mm. Lord. And for those that that are listening and not here on the beach, Lord, there's a breeze blowing in off the ocean. Lord, may that be a picture of your Holy Spirit now blowing in to refresh each of us. We pray you use Pastor Uzi now, uh, Lord, to, to speak to each one of us, to encourage us, to help us keep our eyes fixed firmly on you and you alone. Mm. We ask that now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, happy Mother's Day, all you moms, and uh, good morning to you. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to see the part of the Scripture this morning that Paul is going to address the things of first importance, first importance of things of the faith, like what's the things that are really important in our faith, Um, you know, like... Honestly, this is the sermon that if you don't know much about the Lord, what He's done for us, you don't, maybe you're new, you're a new Christian and you're just learning about the Lord, this is one of the ones you really want to pay attention to. Because there's three key elements that Paul's going to point out in just one paragraph. I mean, he's going to, this is like the best ever um, summing up of the whole gospel message, all crushed down to Reader's Digest. Okay, this is, I mean, that's the best way, I don't know the better way to say it. This is like how to put all of the most important points, what, if someone says to you, I need you to boil it down for me, you know, like quick, just why are you a Christian? What's the big deal? Uh, tell me this, this thing, this gospel, they keep saying gospel, gospel. What's the word gospel mean? Good news. Literally translates good news from the Greek. So gospel is just the Greek word for good news. So the good news is summed up in this very first paragraph of 1 Corinthians 15. And I really encourage you today, even if you're not normally a note taker, that you just do me a favor and jot down the places. I'm going to tell you a few cross references that go with this uh, summing up, okay, so that you can, like, uh, let me read it to you first and then I'll try to explain it as best I can. I have had very little sleep. So Aaron says I always give the best messages when I'm exhausted because the Bible says when we're weak, then we are what? Strong, but not in our own strength. It has to be the Lord. So I need the Lord to make this come together for you guys. I know this part really well. I love this portion of Scripture because of the way it makes it so succinct. It just ties it all together, the good news, in such a quick little nutshell. And yet... I'm at, let me read this to you, and I'm going to challenge you with something and see if you could, you could do this, okay? Let, look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. It says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preached to you, he says, which also you received, and in which also you stand, by which also, he says, you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless, he says, you've believed in vain. Now, can you believe and then not hold fast to your faith? Can, do you know anyone who said, oh, I used to be a Christian? I used to believe that when I was younger, but I don't do that anymore. They're not holding fast to the faith. Paul says, if you hold fast to the faith, then he says, you, you will be saved. He doesn't say, if you don't, though. It's one of the only things that, you know, in Christianity that, we get kind of a strong poke in the backside, so to speak, to, s- to make sure we keep going on. Not to say, yeah, well, I'll do it for a little bit and then I quit. That's not what you signed up for. Okay, when it, com- when it comes to faith in the Lord, this is a lifetime thing that we do until we face him in eternity. And then we'll have finished the race. We'll have fought the good fight, like Paul said. We'll have completed the course. But until then, don't quit- ever quit running the race. 
Don't ever just say, well, I used to do this. No, no. Paul says, I delivered this to you guys, as, uh, 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 and I'm telling you, you're, you're saved if you hold fast to this word which I preached to you. Now, here he's going to tell them the summing up of what he preached to them. And this is the, this is the power sermon of all sermons in the New Testament when it comes to, there's only one other person that gave this sermon this succinctly, and it was Jesus. And I'll show you where he did in just a minute, but it's in the Gospel of Matthew. But right here it says, Paul says, For I have delivered to you of first importance. This is the very first, most important thing of the Gospel. That Christ, he says, has died for our sins according to the Scriptures. First important thing of the gospel of the good news is Christ died for our sins. I mean, you guys know that, right? I mean, if he didn't die for our sins, we're sunk. I mean, we just give up, man. I, I couldn't take care of my own sins. I don't know about you, but I needed help. Now, I never had a problem. You know, when the preacher used to say, you know, uh, we have sin and we need a solution for that, I would be going, uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, I didn't ever fight on the idea that I had sin. That was never even an issue. I came to church going, yeah, I know that part. It's, what do I do about it? And so Paul says, first importance, the very most first important thing that you remember about your sin is that Christ died for it. Christ died for it. He paid the price for your sins according to the scripture. Then the second thing he says he did was found in verse 4, it says, and he was buried. And the third part of the gospel, the third component included in this message, first he died, then he was buried, and then he did what? You guys know this already, right? I mean, you don't have to go to church too long until you figure this one out. You go to, you know, Easter Sunday, even the, even the once or twice a year Christians, they go for Christmas and Easter, the, the resurrection Sunday, they know this part. And on the third day, he what? He rose again, according, it says, to the what? The scriptures. Paul says this is the three things that you need to know. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. And he rose. This is all according, it says, to the scripture. Now, did they have this New Testament book that we have attached to our Old Testament? When, when, when this was written... The answer is no. When they were referring to the scriptures, they're referring to what we call in, in, in modern Christianity the Old Testament. That was the, the, the Jewish scriptures. So according to the Old Testament, not the New Testament. You can't cheat here and use the New Testament, okay? I'm telling you, here's my challenge to you. How many of you could show me in the Old Testament, that's, the scriptures he's saying, according to those scriptures, that Christ would die, that he'd be buried, and that he would rise again. Who could show me in the Old Testament those three components of the gospel? Right here she went, she could. Isaiah, correct. Well, what would you pick in Isaiah? Let's, let's do this together. This is where I want you to take a few notes, because if you're new at this, even some of you that have been around the block a while, it might be a good... Um, what we call refresher, just to bone up a little and remember. Because what if you're talking to a Jewish person? Okay, they don't, they're not going to say, yeah, well, let me hear it from the Gospel of Matthew. They don't want that. They go, I don't even recognize that book. Their, their scripture is our Old Testament. So say you have a Jewish friend and you're going to show them that the Messiah, the one that was promised to the Jews first, then to us Gentiles. It wasn't to us first, guys. It was to them first. Remember Paul said salvation is first to the Jew, then to the Gentile? So say you have a Jewish friend and you really want to minister the gospel to them. In a real simple, succinct way, these are the three components you need to cover. And I don't know why, but a lot of Christians, they don't, I don't know, they might have read this passage, they never thought it was important, but it leads in with, of first importance... Paul says, I mean, it, it kind of gives it away. This is important. Now, this is, can also be translated. See, because I grew up speaking Italian, I read it in my Italian Bible. It's of firstly, the, the way it says it in Italian is a little different, meaning of the most important first in the line. 
not just of first importance. Uh, in English, it kind of softens it, like it's not really that big a deal. Now, this is literally the very first thing that is important for sharing the good news. What if you've got a Jewish friend, you've got to share the gospel with him? What do you lead in with? Well, the first thing you lead in is that the Messiah, that's what they call the Christ, the Savior, the Mashiach, that the Messiah first had to do what? Die for our sins. Then he has to be buried, according to the scripture. And then he has to do some other thing really important. That only the Messiah would fulfill all three of these, rise again from the dead. Now, how do you show, according to the scripture, it says, right? Did you see that? He did, Paul says, all of these things according to the scripture. How many think Paul the Apostle, the Pharisee of Pharisees, could have taught this message without the New Testament to the church at Corinth? Just hand him the Old Testament scriptures and say, Paul, teach us where it says Christ will die where he will be buried, where he will rise from the dead, all for our sins. You think Paul could have done it? Yeah, 53, Isaiah 53, 5, she says. Okay, let's do that. Let's go to Isaiah. But let, I want you to back up even a little smidge further to Isaiah 52, 13. We'll start there, and we'll go all the way through chapter 53. Now, I've read this before here. In fact, I think I just did it recently. I'm so tired I don't remember when I did this last. But, you know, I like reading the Word all the time, so it doesn't matter to me. It's, uh, I'll, I'll do refreshers every day. It's always good for my faith. But in Isaiah 53, verse 13, well, actually, let me read you verse 7 because, oh, well, that's where it was. We just read this on, on the Tuesday night service. It says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him, verse 7 says of Isaiah 52, who brings good news, who announces peace, proclaiming news of happiness, announcing the words of what? Salvation. Our God reigns. Say to, the, say to Zion, your God reigns. Now this is the lead-in to the gospel message from the prophet Isaiah. I always liked him because me and him have the same nickname, is or is he, you know, that's what they had called him for Isaiah. So here, here he is, um, he says in verse 13, Behold my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as, as you were astonished, my people, so it says his appearance would be marred more than any man. His form more than the sons of men. And thus they will sprinkle, he, he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him, for what had not been told them they will see, and, and they, it says, what they had not heard, they will understand. Isaiah 53 verse 1 goes on to say, he says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up, it says, before him like a tender shoot. Like a root out of parched ground, it says, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of man, a man of sorrows, acquainted, it says, with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him Stricken, smitten, the King James says. Afflicted of God. He was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening of our well-being, our peace, fell upon him. And by his scourging or his stripes, we are what? Healed. Who's Isaiah talking about? The Messiah. The one that would come and bear our griefs be smitten by God, be stricken by Him, be punished and bear the weight of the punishment of sin upon Himself. Now it says in verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each one of us. And each one's turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall upon Him. Now the, Paul said of first importance, Christ 
died for our what? Sins. You might want to highlight right here, verse 6, the Lord crossed the iniquity, iniquity means sin, of all of us, all of our sin fell upon Jesus. He was the one who took away the sins. Now we know, because this is promised in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament, you guys know this in John's Gospel, when John the, the Baptist shows up. His first public message when he sees Jesus in public, he, he calls out everyone, Behold the Lamb of God, who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. There he is. That's the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Now, why would he say the Lamb? Did it say, it says we're all sheep that have gone astray. But he's referring to another Old Testament scripture. According to the scripture, there was a promise God made of a lamb. A perfect lamb that would come to be the sacrifice. I'll take you to that passage in just a minute. Let me finish this part here in Isaiah, and then I'm going to turn you to Genesis, if you want taking notes, to chapter 22 of Genesis to show you where the promise of the lamb comes from. All the way from the first book. Now, this is good for you to know because if you're witnessing to one of your Jewish friends, you can't just turn to the Gospel of John and tell them the story. you got to take it to them from their scripture. And if you can turn to their scriptures and show them from Genesis, the very first book of the Old Testament, of their scripture, all the way to Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets in the Jewish culture, that he's in the book of the major prophets, the grouping of the major prophets in the, the way that they classify their scriptures. They have the first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are written all by Moses. And they're highly revered in Jewish culture. So if you take them to the first book of their culture and you show the promise of the Lamb, and you take them to the one of the, they consider Isaiah one of the greatest of the major prophets. They have, they have their Bible grouped by major prophets, minor prophets, the poets, the poetical, we call this the Psalms, and the writings of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Those are the poetical books. Then they have the historical books, the uh, Kings, the Chronicles, those kind of things. They, they have a section in the, Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures that those are all together. Not the same layout, how some of our Old Testament is similar, but there's a little bit of, of, of reorganization you have to learn. And it's by importance to them. So if you're going to do this, you might as well do it of first importance, Paul said. The Messiah would, what? Die for all our sins. You might as well tell them the story the way that they would think of it. Of first importance... Well, let's go with the guy who first, great importance, wrote the first five books. We'll go to Genesis. And the guy who's one of the major prophets that they admired, Isaiah. Now, by the way, the portion of Scripture we're reading right now, Isaiah 52, verse 13, to the end of Isaiah 53, is actually banned in Hebrew, most Hebrew synagogues today. They actually, uh, they have it. They just won't read it. They say, this is too difficult a passage to understand. We don't know who he's speaking of. The reason they don't know is because it says God has placed a veil over their eyes until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. But that veil is going to get lifted one day. So don't be shy about telling your friends, this is the part you guys won't read. Someday it will make sense to you when the veil's lifted. But right now that veil seems to have... A hardness, it says, a partial hardening has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. But don't think that all Jews have that hardening. A partial hardening means some are hardened. You might get one of the ones that's not. And if he's not, or she, you want to tell him Isaiah 52 and 53. And you can tell him, look, right here it says, the Lord caused the iniquity of all of us. You don't have to use John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believes in him should not perish but what? Have everlasting life. You don't have to tell it from, from, from the Gospel of John. You can tell him right here from Isaiah 53. God caused all of our iniquity to fall on the Messiah. 
and he was oppressed, verse 7. He was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Remember when they whipped Jesus and beat him and he did not call out any of the... That's what they used to do to get prisoners to confess their sins. They used to tie them to the whipping, scourging, uh, scour, scourging post, pull their skin real tight and whip them. And if they called out, oh, I did this wrong, then they would. the next scourging would be a little lighter. But if they didn't call out, if they held their tongue, what did the, what did the soldier do? What was he instructed? Beat him hard. Harder, harder and harder till the guy started to fess up his crimes. Yet the more they beat Jesus, the scripture says they beat him until they literally had pulled the skin off of his back, down to the bone. Josephus records for us the beating of Jesus, he said, was so vehement. Because they're so frustrated. This guy did not even open his mouth a word. And that just made him matter. But that fulfills Isaiah 53, 7. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Now Isaiah foresaw the punishment of the Lamb of God being punished, but he didn't open his mouth, he said. And Jesus fulfilled this. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he would be cut off out of the land of the living. He's going to be cut off. What's that mean? Killed. And for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. He's doing it for who? For the Jews, for his people. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet with a rich man in his death. You guys remember? He hung between the thieves on the cross. And then he was buried where? In a rich man's tomb. That it was the it was the what we call the preparation day of the Shabbat, the Sabbath, and they, by law, they couldn't carry. You, you, you're not supposed to even carry your lunch very far, let alone to carry a body. So well, there's this guy here. He's got a tomb right right here around the corner, and can we have his body and put it in that tomb? And so this rich man offered the use of his tomb. It was only a loner, by the way. I mean, even if he thought he was giving it for a long time, it wasn't going to be. Three days later, it's empty. You know, it's actually one of those things he only borrowed it. Yet it says, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, it says, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. You want to prove to a Jew that the Messiah would, would die for their, for their sins? You've got to use their scripture. You want to show them right here. It says, doesn't it say he will bear their iniquities? And what they'll say is, well, we don't know. Was Isaiah speaking of himself or of someone else? Well, how did Isaiah die? So some of you know this. He was good friends to Hezekiah the king. In the book of Chronicles, we read about him. But then after that, he asked, um, he told the king, get your house in order. Your the Lord's telling you it's time for you to go. And, and Hezekiah whined, eh, why should I die? I've been a good king. And, it, and, and he's like, can I just stay a little longer? I wish he wouldn't have done that because he had a, a son, three years. And the Lord goes, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. He goes, well, how do I know? He goes, you want the shadow to go up the stairs or down the stairs? He goes, well, it's going to go down anyway. Go up, Make it go the other way. Like, in other words, make the sun reverse in the sky so that the shadow has to go the opposite direction. Then I'll know it's really God answering. The prophet goes, okay. Can you picture, I mean, I don't, how many read this in the scripture, you, you know this story? The Lord just makes the sun go backwards. Shadow rewinds and he goes, oh, I got 15 more years. All right. And three years later, he has a son. His name's Manasseh. Most wicked king Israel ever saw. 
I mean, here's Hezekiah was written up as one of the most righteous kings that led huge reforms for Israel, brought them out of their idolatrous ways, did all these wonderful things to just be a really good, upright leader. Then to be followed by the most wicked boy. Because 12 years later, when this boy is 12 years old, dad will die. According to the word of the Lord, I'll give you 15 more years. Yeah, and now his boy is 12 years old and he takes over. And he does some of the most grotesque things in Israel. Leads them into idolatrous ways and, and he doesn't like Isaiah. Because Isaiah is telling him to do what's right. So he stuffs him into a hollow log. And he has him sawn asunder from the, between the ankles going up. They sawed the log in half with him alive inside. That's how he had Isaiah killed. So we know that, I mean, and I'm sorry, but this is stuff you learn. You can, the Jews know this in their writings. They have all of these history notes in their synagogues. They know how Isaiah went. And it doesn't say he did not utter a word when he was being sawn asunder. He called out, the judgment God was going to give to Manassas. He, 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 he prophesied to the last breath that he could while being sawn in two. Now that doesn't fit this scripture. And you can tell a Jew who's a good Jew because they can, if they don't know it themselves, they can go ask their rabbi. And the rabbi can confirm it because it's in their notes. He isn't talking about Isaiah so when they give you the, well, we don't know if he's talking about himself or someone else, go, yes, you do. Well, if you don't, your rabbi does, or his rabbi does, because it's already noted that how Isaiah died. And they'll be shocked that you know. That you know their history better than they might know their history. That's okay. Sometimes it takes that little thing to prick the, the thinker into action, you know, to get the, the gray matter involved where they actually... Get the wheels turning. So who's he talking about that's going to come and bear the iniquities? He says, therefore, verse 12 ends the chapter, Isaiah 53, 12. I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sins of many, and he interceded for the transgressors. Now, we already know this is Jesus. Who bore the sins of the many and interceded for the transgressors? Jesus. He was the fulfillment of this. But where did he get the idea of the lamb? That lamb that John the Baptist said, Behold, the lamb of God. According to the scripture, who can tell me? Now, I already gave it to you. It's in Genesis 22. It's found in Genesis 22 where, where Abraham was tested of the Lord. And by the way, is Abraham a good guy to use for example to a Jew? No. Yes, he's called the, the father of the faith in Jewish culture. So if you're going to give a first importance to a Jewish friend, it's okay to lead off with the story about Abraham. In fact, I recommend that you do. Abraham was tested of the Lord, and they know this story, by the way. The Lord ha tells him, take your son, your what? Your only son, which, by the way, he did have another son that was 13 years old named Ishmael, previous to this son. When he, Ishmael's 13, he has the son according to the promise with Sarah. But before that, 13 years old, he, he, they kind of decided, you know, it's not really happening. Let's help God out. I call this the Hagar maneuver. Sarah said, why don't you go into my maidservant, get her pregnant. She gives birth. We'll just raise him up as the fulfillment of God's promise. And God went, that was just your flesh. In fact, the book of Galatians in the New Testament, Paul uses this as an example not to try to get God's work done by the flesh because Ishmael was not even recognized by God. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, the one who Sarah would have, although when the angel came and said, hey, by this time next year, you'll have a son. What was Sarah doing in the tent? Anyone remember? She's laughing. I'm old. There's no way. And Abraham, <laughs> he's 99. It ain't happening. The angel said, I'll be back next year. You'll have a son. 
And you shall name him. Anyone can tell me his name? Laughter. Yeah, laughter. In Hebrew, Isaac means he, meaning up above, he laughs. In other words, who got the last laugh on the story? God. You don't think you can, that I can do this? You just watch. You'll have a boy. Now, when the boy grows up, he says, Abraham, take your son, Isaac, your only son, to the mountain which I shall show you, in the Mount of Moriah, and offer him as a sacrifice. Now, he doesn't tell his son. He just takes the knife, takes the wood, takes his servants. They go towards the Mount of Moriah. They get there, and, 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 and they, they actually tell the servants, you guys stay here, and he says, I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship God. So he doesn't bring his servants to witnesses. He takes his only his son. And his son says to dad, hey, dad, we got the knife. We got the wood. And who's carrying the wood, by the way? The son is bearing the wood on his own shoulders. He's carrying the wood. And they get there and they build the altar. And he says to him, son, don't worry. God he says something really unique. God will provide himself a lamb. In Hebrew, it's very specific. It's, it's weird because it doesn't sound correct. He says, God will provide himself. Now, the father of the faith, Abraham, proclaimed this to his son. But it says they wandered for how many days? Who can tell me? Before they put up the altar. Three days. For three days, in the eyes of the father, who's going to be dead? His son, his only son. And he brings him to the Mount of Moriah, which, by the way, just so you know this, for those of you like a little bit topography lesson, the Mount of Moriah is a ridge that runs through Jerusalem, and it actually has a hill on it called Golgotha, or in Latin, Calvary. Golgotha means in Hebrew, the place of the skull. Because on the side of the mountain, when the sun is high in the day, you actually can see these caves that are in the side of this hillside, and it looks like the sockets of the eye of a skull and the mouth, the nose. It literally looks like a skull. And on the top of that hill, on this range of the Mount of Moriah, is this hill called Golgotha. And I, I submit to you, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask for a re, you know, like review, watch the tape. Can I see where the mount is that you told Abraham to go? Because I got a feeling it's pretty specific. He wanders for three days, and he gets to the mount, the very specific place, and the Lord says, stop right here. Build the altar. They build the, put the stones, they put the wood, and the son says, where's the sacrifice? He goes, lay down, son. And he's going to sacrifice his son. You guys know the story, right? Genesis 22. And he raises his hand with the knife to, to plunge it into his son. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't get freaked out. It's just it's a test. The angel Lord says, stop. You pass the test. Over there, caught in the thicket by its horns, is a ram. Take that ram and offer it instead of your son. So he offers the ram, not lamb, the ram. You say, well, wait a minute. He said God would provide himself a what? A lamb. And so if you look with me at Genesis 22, if your Jewish friend is asking you the question, say, well, right here it says, Abraham, verse 6 of Genesis 22, took the wood, the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. He took in his hand the the fire and the knife. And so the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire, the wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Listen, Jews pay close attention to all details. Where's the lamb? And Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh. In Hebrew, that means God shall provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on to together. They came to the place which God told them. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac, verse 9 says, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay him. And the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. 
He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for I now know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went, took the ram, offered him up for the burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, what did he call it? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham was prophesying as it is said to this day. Now, who's writing this? Who, who, I told you who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Moses. Moses is writing as it is said to this day. The day when Moses wrote the book of Genesis, he said, listen, this has been a saying that has gone on all the way since back in Abraham's day. Remember, Abraham has to have Isaac. Isaac has to have Jacob. Jacob gets his name changed to Israel. Israel has these sons, these 12 sons, right? The, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of one of those tribes, the Levites, comes this guy named Moses. I'm summing up a lot of history, sorry, but it's like a thousand years later, and he's going, um, it's still said to this day, as it is said to this day, Jehovah Jireh, in the mount of the Lord, God shall provide himself a what? A lamb. So if you ever have a Jewish friend say, what's the big deal about Jesus being called the, what's John the Baptist call him? The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There's your justification to show them according to their scripture, not the New Testament. Their scripture, you say, didn't your scripture say that God would provide himself a lamb? And didn't he provide a ram? So that wasn't the lamb, was it? The ram was so that Isaac got out of it. But Isaac wasn't the sacrifice. Isaac was a type. Now, Jews love types and shadows. That when you teach a study like this and you say, here's a type of the Messiah. The son, the only son becomes the sacrifice. Well, God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten son. Why do you think that detail is important? Because it's shadowed right here. It's foretold in the scripture. God would provide himself his only begotten son who would be the lamb that Isaiah spoke of that would take all of our iniquities and put on him. He'd bear our sins. That lamb would be the sacrifice for our sin. Of first importance, guys, Christ has died for our sins according to the scriptures. I've gone, how long, I did print, is that full length? Okay, I got two more parts. Still got to bury him and raise him according to the scripture. But I'm going to give you guys a whole week to do your homework and see if you can prove to me, according to the scripture, you did really good on the first one. Anita gets this star sticker, A plus. She, 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 got, she, got, she got it, man. Isaiah, right straight off the bat. Show me where he's going to be buried. Show me where he's going to be raised three days later. According, not to the New Testament, no cheating now. You, you might learn it in the New Testament because it's quoted from the Old Testament. That's allowed. You can do homework like that. But I want you to make sure you can show me from the Old Testament scripture where he gets buried and three days later he gets raised. All according to the scripture. Because is this important to a Jew? Yes. Paul says of first importance most important bolts, nuts of the gospel, the very foundation of the gospel is Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose all according to the scripture. And if you can do this, if you can just learn this, I know it's, you know, I'm summing up a lot of history here to bring up this point. But Paul says, I taught you guys this stuff already. How long was Paul the pastor at Corinth? Do you guys remember? 
a year and a half. Do you think Paul might have covered this in a few sermons? In a year and a half's time, do you think Paul could have maybe elaborated? Let's do the Abraham story today with Isaac. Next week we'll do Isaiah. Is he put too much together for you in one sermon? He's too ambitious. He's up all night. He's up all night. We got a new puppy. <laughs> and a kid, like, they, you know, you can't trust them when they're new. It's like, you hear, and you're like, grab it, run outside. Then you're standing out there in the cold. Go, go, come on. This puppy is great, man. This puppy, you get it out there and it goes pee pee. She, she, they say in Hawaiian. And it eats and poops. It eats and poops. It sleeps, eats, poops. Repeat. The only problem is, is like, you got to make sure you don't sleep through the night because Jan, the first night was up. She took the first watch and she was up three or four times in the night. She said she was sleeping with it next to her and it would start going. <laughs> and she knew, jump, run. And I, I'm really good. She's showing pictures already on her phone, you guys. So I, I, you know, for those of you that want to see pictures, you can look on, f on Facebook, especially on Jan's. She's got all the good pictures on it. I have the, no, I put it on your Facebook wall, right? The, I have a, a, a comedy thing I read about battles, picking your battles from a, a clean comedian does a little thing. Them, you need a little laugh this week. Just learn that I should have used this for a battle, but I didn't. I lost anyway. He says, <laughs> You know how they tell guys getting married, the young guys? Remember now, getting married? Got some advice for you. Pick your battles. The comedian does this really well. He's like, pick your battles. He said, then his, he's going along in his bed. And he says, they don't say that to the women. You getting married? To the gals, you're going to win. <laughs> you're going to win a lot. He said he was, he was six months into his marriage. And his wife came home and said, honey, let's get a dog. And he's like, no. A lot of work, a lot of money, they destroy stuff. No, let's don't do that. No, honey, it's going to be great. Let's get a dog. No, I don't think we should do that. No, honey, really, let's go, let's go to the store now and get a dog. He says, I think I'm going to use one of my battles. <laughs> and she's like, what? He's like, obviously, no one taught her that we have to pick our battles. So I decided I'm going to, this one I should use one of my battles for. I'm going to use a battle for this one. And he had to explain the whole thing about picking a battle. So I'm picking this for a battle, okay? No dog. He said, and then we went to the store and got a dog. <laughs> my wife, I, I posted that during the week when she was putting the dog's picture on her phone, in the phone, in the in the van, we have those little thing. You clip the phone so your hands free. You know, it's on the hold, holds it there. She put the picture of the puppy from the Humane Society with his little ears all <laughs> sitting there, looking like, "Take me home! I'm in torment here. Get me out of jail!" <laughs> you know, and she keeps flipping through the pictures and putting them right there while I'm driving. Honey, we should go get this puppy. I should use this as a battle. I think. But it's a really cute puppy, actually. I kind of like it, you know. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, and she's like, oh, doesn't it look cute? And then the screen goes black. She hurries up and re like, <laughs> wait, look at this picture. Driving, and it would be on the day when the traffic's horrific. We're like, they're doing that construction on Henry and putting the pavement, and we can't go that way. And we're like, well, she's like, you could go down here towards the, towards the dump if you just turn here by the Civic Center and, and then we could pass by the Humane Society. It's right on the way. <laughs> Picking my battles. I'm not doing it. Yeah, she says it's mom already. I told her, happy Mother's Day. She goes, I think it's happy Father's Day. You like the dog, too. I do like the dog. He's, got, he's all white, and he has a little patch on his eye, so I call him Patch. Because he looks like a pirate dog, you know. He's got a little patch on his eye, so... so big ears and, they, and one's flopped to the side. So if you want just for, for some fun, you look on her um, Facebook wall and you'll see the, the comedian. He, the, he goes on and tells a whole thing about getting a Coke with the family at, at a meal. The and um, the dog's name is Patch, like Eye Patch. 
I just went, you know, I'm old school, just easy stuff to remember. <laughs> so I had my favorite dog growing up was named Patches. He had splotches of of colors on his fur. So uh, th this is a th this is a, you know, whatever throwback to that. He's Patch. So um if you want to come over and see our puppy, he can't come out yet. He has one more round of shots to go and you know before you're supposed to take him out in the public, but you know, don't you wash your hands, come over right there. <laughs> Yeah, like a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, next week, I really do want you to learn from the Old Testament. So what are the two places, if you're going to show to your Jewish friend, the lamb and the suffering for our sin, what two chapters would you use from the Bible? Just, just tell me the book and the chapter. Genesis 22, Isaiah 52, and 53. Okay, that'll get you close enough. If you can get there, you'll be able to share this with your Jewish friend. And th they'll respect you a lot more that you tell it to them from their scripture, not from your New Testament. Because, you know, a lot of Christians, I found they're like, well, I'm only a New Testament Christian. I don't, I don't do the Old Testament. I said, that, they didn't have the New Testament when this was written. Everything was taught from the Old Testament. Paul taught the church at Corinth all the sermons from the Old Testament. You can teach the gospel, the good news, strictly from the Old Testament. You don't actually have to have the New Testament to do it. You might have to learn a few more stories, but it's all right there. And I'll show you the next part next week, okay? And then, then after that, we'll see how Paul says the Lord revealed himself to him by, and he's literally, by the grace of God, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And that's a really encouraging message that's coming up after that. So please read ahead for me, the rest of Corinthians 15. We're, only, we're coming to the end. It's only got one more chapter of that, chapter 16. It's winding down. But it actually kind of, he's a real skilled writer. He does the, um, you know how good writers put that, the big heavy nugget at the end of the story, you know, like they, they, they're setting you up and you're just reading and you're like, it's getting better. It's getting, now who's done it? What's going to happen? I mean, he like literally does that when it comes to the gospel. He has the best way of putting this stuff. So the juicy stuff is coming up, okay? So, so I, I encourage you, please read ahead if you can. And um, come out on Tuesday. We're going to continue seeking the Lord and um, learning more about the, the fruits of the Spirit and the differing things that we need to walk in the Spirit. And we're going to be starting the book of Galatians on Tuesday night. So uh, if you want to learn about how to do things in this, in this walk that we face by the Spirit's leading, not, not by the natural mind or the flesh, but by God's Spirit helping you, then come out for that. I really highly recommend it as we, as we go chapter by chapter through the book of Galatians starting this week, okay? So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray as we go from here, your Spirit would give us grace, Lord, to... To be able to, to just file these things away in our memory, Lord, to, to be able to recall them on the day when they're needed, Lord, for maybe one of the Jewish folks that you may have cross our path, that we could be able to share with them this great hope of your gospel, your good news, that you laid out in their, in their book, Lord, for us. Let us be able to share it with them back in true love and grace. I ask that in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me listening to a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord? Love. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.